Distinguished panelists, this dear participants, good morning or good evening to some of you. And welcome to the first webinar of our International Leadership Conference on Contemporary Challenges to the World Order, the Search for Solutions. My name is Jacques Marion. I'm the co-chairman of the Universal Peace Federation for Europe and the Middle East. As this first webinar is jointly organized together with UPF Japan, let me wish a warm welcome to our Japanese audience. We have an eminent panel of speakers who will be introduced in a minute by our moderator. But first, let me say a few words about this ILC 2022, which is being simultaneously held throughout the world in Asia, Africa, Europe and the Middle East, and North and South America. For nearly two decades, UPF has been sponsoring international leadership conferences to address the critical challenges of our time, bringing together experts from every country and every sphere of activity, whether political, academic, religious, business, media, or the arts, in order to explore non-governmental approaches to the peaceful resolution of conflict. In today's context of war in our region and tension rising among superpowers, this conference, ILC 2022, will examine leading trends that are shaping the world order and suggest workable directions. In the next two days, we will hold three webinars, beginning with this one on the implication of South Korean elections, then one this afternoon on the role of the United Nations, and the third one tomorrow morning on the Global Peace Road Initiative. These three webinars deal with issues that UPF and its founders, Dr. Sun Myung Moon and Dr. Hak Jahan, have focused on for many years, since they represent in their eyes crucial steps towards sustainable peace in the world, namely the reunification of the Korean Peninsula, a re-empowerment of the United Nations, and the development of a prosperous economic zone in Northeast Asia, which would benefit every continent. At a time when the deeply rooted conflicts of the 20th century seem to re-emerge and lead toward a new era of confrontation and division in the world, we hope that ILC 2022 will allow us to see beyond conflict and point toward peaceful solutions. I'm sure you will have interesting presentations and discussions. For your questions, please use the Q&A icon at the bottom right of your screen. And now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce the moderator for this webinar, Mrs. Rita Payne from the United Kingdom. Rita Payne has worked for nearly 30 years at the BBC until she became the Asia editor at BBC World, World News. Before moving to TV, she was a news editor, producer, presenter at BBC World Service Radio. Latterly, she served as president of the Commonwealth Journalists Association, and she's directly, currently, its president emeritus. Rita, the floor is yours. So basically, these are, as you mentioned, challenging times for anybody who is fighting for peace. Um, at the same time, Universal Peace Federation is always gives us hope that no matter how bad the situation is, that there's some sort of solution can be found. But these are dark days. So on March the 9th, the people of South Korea elected their new president, Mr. Yoon suk Yo, a conservative politician who will succeed President Moon Jae-in as president. Not only South Koreans, but all the other six nations, such as North Korea, the United States, Japan, Russia, and China, are stakeholders in the future of the Korean Peninsula. However, the newly elected president's policies contribute to sustainable peace and development have yet to be seen. Will he be able to stand up against the continuing threats by North Korea? Can Mr. Yoon suk Yeol mend the rift between Japan and Korea? Can he fulfill the expectations of many young Koreans regarding the rising unemployment in the country? These and other questions will be discussed by a distinguished panel of journalists from Asia and the West. And we are truly honored to have them here because each speaker has a distinguished record and knowledge of what is going on behind the scenes, and they will actually be able to influence 
opinion. So we have, as um, Mr. Jacques Marion has already said, that um, the speakers are from different parts of the world. And uh, I will just mention very briefly and give you greater background when I introduce them. But among the speakers we have is Mr. Michael Breen, author and commentator based in South Korea. He is CEO, Inside Communications Consultant and former correspondent for the Washington Times, Washington Times and The Guardian. We then have Mr. Yongjo Jin Oh, president and publisher, The Korea Times. Professor Rofsham Ibrahimov, Professor Hankook University of Foreign Studies, College of Oriental Studies, South Korea. Mr. Yoji Koda, Vice President, Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force. So as you can see, we have guests for, you know, who are gracing this panel, who are, you know, we are very, very fortunate, honored to be able to have their opinions. So could I possibly start now? by inviting Mr. Michael Breen to give us his overview of what he thinks is going on, um, the implications of the South Korean election and the impact it's like to have on security in the region and the world. Okay, yeah, I'm happy to do that. Thanks very much, Rita, and thanks to UPF for the invitation. Um, as the first speaker, um, I have an advantage of covering ground that other speakers might be planning to cover, so I'll get there before them. Uh, but but let me, uh, I'm sure a lot of you don't need to be told this, but for the benefit of non-Koreans who may not be too familiar with Korean naming, uh, Mr. Yoon, Yoon is the surname, Yoon Sokyal, Yoon is the surname. Um, not He's not Mr. Yul or Mr. Yol. There are just a, a interesting factoid for you. There are only 153 surnames in South Korea, which are used by over 1,000 people. And Yoon is the eighth most popular with over 1 million Yoons in this country of 50 million people. Um, and of the 13 presidents, including him, since South Korea was established in 1948, he will be the second Yoon. Um, Sokyol is the first name, and Mr. O, oh, who speaks after me, will correct my uh, British pronunciation of that. But uh, the vowel in each syllable is the same, even though the English spelling is different. Don't blame Mr. You, you, uh, Mr. Yoon for that, blame the English spelling system. Um, so also for the benefit of non-Koreans, uh, and maybe for Koreans as well, uh, I'd like to make a general point about political preferences or, or how we identify people uh, politically. And this may be helpful, especially if you find yourself ill disposed or well disposed to uh, politicians before they've opened their mouth, according to whether the press calls them conservative or liberal. So Mr. Yoon is usually referred to as a conservative. But in much of its outlook and many of its systems, uh, South Korea is what you could call socialist, although that word is not you. Um, uh, what I mean by this is central government control and a culture of equality and putting the group before the individual and so on. All these themes are kind of socialistic. So when you ask what a Korean conservative is conserving, you will find he's not exactly the rugged individual, uh, individualist or the libertarian of say American conservatism. So the real distinction in the Korean context is that the country we're in, this is my opinion, uh, you guys might disagree with me, but the country that the conservative finds himself loyal to is the Republic of Korea. That's his country, it's a real country, it's flawed as any country is. And if North Korea wants to join it later, that's great. The liberals, uh, or many of them on the left of the spectrum, uh, are loyal to a reunified Korea, which exists at the moment only in their minds, uh, where it can be pristine and pure. Uh, and they think that they need to negotiate the birth of this baby with North Korea, and that's what makes them bend over backwards to mix metaphors uh, looking for a breakthrough. 
Besides that, in my opinion, politics in this country is not so ideological as pragmatic. Leaders manage the improvement that, that we see with increasing wealth, and they tend to do the opposite of what their predecessors did. So with that in mind, what do I think we can expect from a Yoon administration? Initially, I'm guessing nothing that will rock the boat because there are local government elections in June. And also for the next two years, he faces a national assembly, which is controlled by his opponents. So that will also keep him in check. How about with regard to domestic politics, his political style? You may have read that Mr. Yoon is refusing to live and work in the presidential blue house. This is the official place where his predecessors have lived and had their offices and those of their uh, advisory and policy making staff. And he says he's doing this because he objects to the overly powerful presidency, the imperial presidency, as it's called, that the Blue House represents. And he says he wants to clean up uh, the corruption in politics that the imperial presidency tends to foster, and he wants to strengthen democracy. But every new president says that. Um, and given that Mr. Yoon was until recently the head of the prosecutor's office, the institution that has least developed since democracy in 1987. Uh, I, I'm a little bit cynical about this. I think it's a gesture. Um, but let's move on to foreign policy in the area I think you're particularly interested in. Um, I expect that the most obvious changes uh, for, for Korea under the new president will be in foreign policy. Korea, as you all know, is very close with the United States and uh, China is its close neighbor and its main trading partner by far. 25% of Korean exports and imports I think, uh, are with China. With the US, it's a little over half that. The instinctive tendency uh, in diplomacy is to give mixed signals and keep on as best terms with each side as possible. Yun, however, interestingly is being is dropping this ambiguity now that may be because he's new to politics um, he's got no political experience by the way um, his, his experiences as a prosecutor um, but i suspect this is his real thinking or the th and the thinking of those around him he seems to want to lean very clearly on the u.s side, to the u.s side and expand the already very close relations that the country has with the United States. Now, depending how he does this, this could lead to difficulties with China. Um, relations with Japan will certainly improve under a President Yoon, and that's not hard to do simply because his predecessor, Moon Jae-in, had uh, a policy that was extraordinarily destructive in diplomatic terms. For example, he completely unnecessarily ripped up an agreement uh, with Japan negotiated by his predecessor that settled the World War II comfort women issue. Why? As I mentioned, Moon's camp is loyal to a future reunified Korea. And in their narrative, uh, it was Japan whose occupation caused the division in the first place into two Koreas. This puts Japan in sort of the position of Satan in this narrative. And so deals with the devil are unacceptable. Yuna will manage all this much better. How he actually does that remains to be seen. And I'm sure once he was elected, there was a huge sigh of relief in Tokyo. Uh, finally, with uh, talking about North Korea, which I think is our main interest, uh, Yoon has said that North Korea's nuclear weapons must go before there is any engagement. This is a very, very significant change for uh, the South Korean position. Why does he say this? Three reasons, I think. One is that his predecessor's five-year effort to forge a breakthrough with North Korea <clears throat> bore no fruit. So why follow the same path to nowhere? And this is not to criticize uh, President Moon for his efforts. I think particularly in UPF, you're looking for 
ways to um to 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 engage and have some kind of breakthrough with north korea he tried everything second reason uh, as i say yoon is loyal the, the the country he has in his mind is south korea not to the fantasy baby nation waiting to be born and this allows him to see more clearly what the problem is which is that it's North Korea that is blocking unification. North Korea doesn't want unification. Why? Because it won't be good for them. There's no upside, at least not for their leader. Third, uh, Yoon, in, in saying that he uh, that North Korea's nuclear weapons must go as a precondition for engagement, he's aligning his position with that of the United, of the United States. So North Korea right now, as we speak, is pumping up the rhetoric uh, attacking South Korea, and I expect they will probably try some provocation just to try and test and see how serious Yoon is on this. So I think we're in for a rough ride this year, but not to worry, this is the normal pattern. Tension of this sort leading in a few months or in a year to talks, then the talks going nowhere and ending followed by a period of quiet, and then it starts again. And this, unfortunately, will, I think, will be the continuing pattern until one day when it isn't. And that's the day we're hoping for. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Michael. And also for correcting misconceptions and for clarifying names and labels we attach to people. Um, with the new president, um, from what one reads, as you say, it's becoming closer to the US. Do you think that on the whole, given what's happening in Ukraine, given the fears that China may be emboldened, other countries might be emboldened when it comes to say Taiwan or their own issues, um, what do you think that um, the new president will be, a, how do you think he'll be able to influence security? Is that his main concern or will his main concerns be domestic issues? Um, I suspect his main concerns will be domestic issues, particularly the economy. Um, uh, I think what he wants to do by, by leading to the US, um, my interpretation of this is that um, he wants to shift South Korea from a, you know, you, you know, there's a, you, you might be familiar with this expression, the Koreans use it to describe themselves that historically they were like a shrimp caught between the fighting whales of big powers. And so that historically the Koreans have been very alert to what the big powers around them do, and they strategically lean to one side, then to the other, or try and forge a neutral path as a survival strategy. Now, South Korea is one of the most powerful countries in the world, militarily, economically, in terms of soft power, culturally. So this sort of um, behavior as a sort of, a, oh, aren't we a poor, weak nation? is a posture that no longer suits the country. And so I think by leaning to the US, he's actually saying we're in the democratic camp. These, the US and other allies, these are the countries that share our values. So we will deal with non-democracies. You know, China's our biggest trading partner, but we do not share their values. And so I think that's what he means by that. I don't think um, forging a breakthrough with North Korea is going to be a priority for him. But, you know, history is full of ironies. And it may well be a leader like this. You know, on somebody's watch, this is going to happen. It's going to, we're going to have the moment when some, there is some kind of breakthrough. But I don't think he's desperately seeking it in the way that President Moon has been. Well, thank you. In a way, maybe. Um... Well, let's hope. <laughs> That's all I can say. Now, if I could invite Mr. Yong Jin Oh, president and publisher of the Korea Times, to give his views. Uh, Mr. Yong Jin Oh is a graduate of Song Kyun, I am, I'm going to massacre this pronunciation, Sung Kyun Wan University, Republic of Korea. He joined the Korea Times in July 1988 as staff reporter and became a culture sports desk staff reporter. Mm -hmm. 
He subsequently worked at the city business and politics desk. After serving in various deputy managing editor positions, Mr. O became managing editor in 2012. After subsequently serving as chief editorial writer, digital managing editor, and director of content and digitization, he became the president publisher of the Korea Times in April 20. So Mr. Yong Jin Oh, what do you think on the whole is a reaction amongst the South Korean population? Because the margin seems to have been very narrow, about 1% in the vote before i start i need to make us you know a, a little observation the regarding the uh, presentation by um, michael Britt. i momentarily thought that he tore on my thoughts because what he called what he presented is a almost identical carbon copy of what i'm going to say and I think, you know, he has, you know, forced the speaker's advantage to his uh, it's a past use. Thank you so oh, I'm much sorry for, about that. I'm sorry for about ruining, that. ruining my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, you know, the, on, on, you know, momentarily, I, I, you know, the, I changed my mind. It was not, you know, the act of us, act of us, it, it's more like, you know, the, I've been uh, quite, you know, the tummy with the micro bit. We have uh, been, you know, uh, talking with each other. Uh, about a lot of issues on almost a regular basis. And we, our friendship dates, you know, the, a lot of years back. So I, I think we share, you know, the, as a persons in the, you know, the, uh, the, in the, you know, the on Korean Peninsula, in the, you know, the, the low cost of action. I think we, you know, the, we are seeing the same thing. And I think we are, you know, uh, on the same page about the, a lot of the things that is, you know, the, this speaking and after saying that i think you know the i want to thank you so much for the you know the kind of, you know the uh, introduction and i try to you know the stick to you know the uh, uh what i'm you know the trying to say faithfully as possible number one i, I think you know the, uh, the i wanted to speak of the given subject in three parts and i will you know definitely you know the refer to the you know the you know the retomation uh, what retomation about the you know the narrow margin between the two you know the candidates uh in in the you know the voting uh number one i think you know the uh president elect uh Yun Song -yeol after the election and number two and i will talk about what is happening to most the candidate the ejemia number three and the main point is to create some potential change of direction in policy in the next five years under uh, the president uh, Yun. Biggest to brow haha. This is uh, you know the uh, the reason I, I I you know the talk about the you know the similarity between my presentation and the you know the uh, uh, Rin's presentation. It's about you know the Chongwa Day. The biggest brow haha triggered by uh, Yun, the president elect, uh, is the uh, his plan to vacate the Chongwa Day, the presidential office complex. And move to uh, Yongsan, not far away from now empty uh, U.S. Yongsan garrison. Incumbent President Moon Jae-in had promised to move from Chongade during his presidential campaign, but went back on it, saying that it would cost too much, and there were few alternative places. Yun is different, and he bowed to move and start to work as a president in Yongsan on May 10th, the first day is his first day in office. And he said he will return Chongade to the people. The Chongade served as residence of governors of general during the Japanese, the colonial occupation. And then it was used as a quarters in 1945 to 1948 for the general John Hart, commanding general, of US Army forces in Korea. Uh, the military administrator after uh, the Second World War. And thus, the place bears the sad chapters of history. Even though current polls show more opposition than support for the move, uh, situation may quickly turn around for Yun once people are allowed to visit the Chongade premises 
does the far forbidden palace of a sword. And he will uh, likely help the birds to use popularity and his uh, people's party's uh, chances in June first local elections. All told, the Yongsan shows Yun may be political novice, but possess political cumulative. Now, the second subject, Lee jae He's a progressive and a former Gyeonggi governor. He is the lost candidate of the ruling Democratic Party, has been hibernating since the loss. But don't take his conspicuous absence as a sign that he's gone for good. He got only a quarter million votes short of a victory. That's out of 44 million eligible votes. That's, that's enormous political capital. The likeliest, likeliest scenario is that he would try to gain control of the party. He would try to be party chairman. So he can exercise the power to select the party candidates for 2024 general elections. Then move on and run for 2027 presidential election. That's the best taken by Moon Jae-in, the current president, after his loss to Park geun As a party leader, he would have an advantage of a strong majority in the National Assembly. His party has 172 affiliated lawmakers in the 300 strong unicameral party. The number can be used to thwart every legislative or otherwise effort to be made by President Yoon. However, Lee wouldn't likely oppose it for opposes the sake. Likelihood is that considering Lee is a, a policy wonk, the next five years would be a policy due, something that is quite unusual for Korean parliament. Back to Mr. Moon, uh, he's a clean slate. He's a persecutor through and through. He didn't have any credit as an administrator or legislator, nor did he have any foreign affairs experience. So predicting how the UN administration will run its a diplomacy requires considering two factors. First, his disposition. He's a hard-headed, stubborn, as it required of any successful prosecutor. He graduated from Seoul National University, first rate, top university, and passed the bar exam. So apparently he's a smart. In other words, he's a clean slate, but he can learn very quickly. Or told, he would rely on his advisors for most important diplomatic issues, at least for the first you know, couple of years. And the important issues, North Korea, United States, and his advisors are most the U.S. president, the Park Jin. Uh, now he's a, a representative lawmaker for uh, People's Party, and possible a, a likely and possible candidate for foreign minister. He is a religious about the Iraq U.S. alliance, and Park is now in U.S as a uh, Yun's special emblem. Yun's tutor in diplomatic affairs, Kim Song-hwan, former vice foreign minister under conservative president Kim young ha is now in uh, prison. He's not the, you know, the Mr. Kim, but you know, the, the president, former president uh, Im Young-bak is, is still in prison. He's also pro-American. Then uh, nominate, recently nominated, uh, Prime Minister Han Dok Su served as ambassador to U.S. and is our by technocrat in NATO, paired to surely for U.S. While campaigning, President-elect Yoon talked about hosting more U.S. interceptor missiles, the Thad, theater high altitude aerial defense. And those already, those missiles, we have uh, some already in, in Korea caused uh, China to slap on ban things Korean, K-pop, tourist, Korean businesses, among other things. During his campaign, the Yun talked about the Koreans' dislike of Chinese 
he was not wrong. He was not, you know, incorrect. As shown in the post confirming his remarks about the Koreans anti-Chinese sentiment. Throw in all, throw everything together. The picture would be that Korea brings from one extreme to another. Pro Chinese under President Moon, to pro American under Yun. Pro American sentiment appears more prevalent now among Koreans after US withdrawal from Afghanistan and unfolding Ukraine crisis. Koreans would read from these events the Korean is a the strong alliance with the United States now more than ever. Two risks are foreseen. First is a China backlash. backlash. China would try to put the pressure on the Korea as it did over the past. But Korea has once before experienced China backlash. So it didn't feel as severe as the first time. Rather, China being painted into corner during the, the confrontation with the US may refrain using its leverage as number one trading partner to penalize Korea. If Korea tries to join Quad or quadrilateral security dialogue, a US led effort to contain China, on other members, the other members include Australia, India, and Japan. How would China react? Would China try to punish Korea with all attempts? Perhaps it may go to the extent of catering to Korea in, in growing friction with, uh, with the United States. Or third, still like any change from pro-Chinese to pro-American, it would surely upset the status quo. And status quo, I think addition of any change, they created you know, the new energy. And that means instability. Then North Korea now testing ICBMs to gain US attention. It's their habit at the start of any US administration, they, they would resort to the brinkmanship like this to gain attention from the from Washington, Washington's new government. Put two and together the whole picture outcome is a would be greater uncertain. Korea has been spared a state of a crisis for the past four years since the Pyeongchang Olympics. That's a watershed moment during the opening ceremony of the, the Olympics, the high power, high profile delegation, including a uh, sister of uh, Kim Jong-un, North Korean leader, visited Korea, participated in opening ceremony. And that was a watershed moment from which possibility, palpable, palpable possibility of a war was, a, was, a, was a relaxed. And replaced by the, the you know four following years of peace. Choppy water ahead of uh, Korea, and Mr. Yoon. Korea would uh, look to the inexperienced skipper, that's Mr. Yoon, for leadership. And I and we I pray that he will steer us from the harm's way. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. It's uh, given us. A very good perspective on the impact on Korea itself. Uh, just one question. I mean, everyone's spoken about his, the new president-elect's lack of political experience. Do you think in the long run, it is going to go in his favor or against? Because he made some very good gestures. You know, the fact that he's not going to the official, um, staying in the official residence. Um, are, is that just window dressing or do you think that that gives you hope that um, about how he's going to turn out to be if he's in place for the next five years. Number one, the present, our the the presidential uh, system uh, allows only one term, five years, so it's very short period. So 
uh, as a, one of my uh, um, the colleagues wrote in a column for Korea Times, the Yun's lambda phenomena has already started even before he takes office. That's one thing. And I, I think he's a, you know, the political experience could be good or bad, but because when we look back, uh, other president who were politicians and experienced, they uh, accept for uh, President Kim Dae-jung, most of them, I think, uh, proved to be failures in terms of diplomacy. So I, I think it's, uh, you know, the, uh, maybe, you know, that I'm trying to be, you know, as a hopeful as, you know, any, as anyone in Korea want to be. It's like, a, you know, the new present without the experience, perhaps he can bring the new and a different perspective to the, to the job. And maybe that makes, you know, the, the great deal of difference. And maybe that turned out to be something you know the good for auspicious support here that's my answer thanks very much indeed um now i would like to invite our next speaker professor dr ravshan ibrahimov professor hankook university of foreign studies college of oriental studies south korea ravshan ibrahimov is a professor of Hankook University, as I said, of foreign studies and oriental studies. He has been working at the university since March, 2015. Between 1999 and 2014, Dr. Ibrahim worked at Kafkaz University, Azerbaijan, where he held the positions of head of department of international relations, head of department of European studies, vice rector on external affairs, in the period between 2011 and 2014, he was head of foreign policy analysis department at the Center for Strategic Researches under the President of the Republic of Azerbaijan. Dr. Ibrahimov received his PhD from Ankara University, Turkey. He is the author of a book, EU External Policy Towards the South Caucasus, How Far Is It From Realization? And he's written several other books. And he's the author of more than 200 articles and comments in various academic journals and books. The scope of his research interests include energy policy, energy security, European Union, foreign and energy policy, the former Soviet Union states, Turkish and Turkish foreign policy. So I guess one question that springs to mind is that when you look at the situation in Ukraine and what we look, it's really the search for energy, reliance on energy is at the root of a lot of the world's concerns at the moment. So, I mean, do tell us your views about the South Korean election impact in general, but also maybe a bit more about the energy issue. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. I'm greeting you. I will also try to answer through the perception of energy policies, but if we look back to the Korean presidential elections, I want to make some preconditional uh, starting as my previous uh, co, uh, uh, like Mr. Michael Breen and Mr. Roch, uh, for better explanation of auditorium, that what is important to know that Korean um, is a presidential uh, republic, and uh, that means a president is number one, in country, and as Mr. Oh already mentioned, that uh, a, a president can be elected only for one time, which is quite contradictory. Because if you have presidential system, so president should have a little bit more term in order to make long-term policies, which is not possible in the current uh, situation in Korea, and it also affected political atmosphere generally, because. Uh, presidents try to act carefully, and it also have some kind of uh, general negative humor about the presidential stuff in Korea. Almost all were criminalized, except maybe the last president. And this is also make uh, of leaders of the state making some uh, careful steps in order to have general and long-term observation and policies. 
the moon chain was not an exception actually that's why democrats lost the elections in korea and one more point that i want to make structural explanation of the situation and societal uh, reality of the korean uh, today and if we look back through the uh, period of independence and after the korea war 1950 to 1953 like during the last 70 years korea has changed three generation and three generation completely different on societal uh, components like first generation is traditional uh, second is thanks to uh, industrialization was a modern society representative and third and current generation who are currently my students are postmodern uh, uh, society representatives they are product of uh, high technological achievements and development so actually there are only three cases of unique such unbelievable economic development in the world like Taiwan, Singapore, and South Korea. But if we look to Korea, the most conservative country among these three is South Korea. It also have own reasons why it's happened like that. And currently, if we talk about presidential election which held recently in Korea, I should tell that uh, the winning of um, uh, candidate of uh, conservative party has several reasons. First, Still, despite that Korea economically postmodern, politically it's not past this stage. So it is still like in between traditional and modern society. I even can show you a map, like how people voting in Korea. Like if you look and can see clear, I don't know whether you see or not, you can see like red and blue. Blue it is those who voted for Democrats and red for uh, conservatives and you can see that it has regional division and since the korea became in uh, democracy in 1987 this regional division is still uh, actual so some regions voted no matter who is candidate they will vote for either progressive or for the uh, conservative candidate because this is like somehow making tradition this is like uh, common uh, let's say general opinion of the region so this is most true for let's say uh traditional and modern society rather than postmodern society another future that new generation has no any candidate in the current elections which can pretend and reflect and represent them in the following five years they are not hearing what they really waiting for for example some economic reforms some social changes even there are some sociological problems related like some feminism movements which is also has unique roots in korea rather than in other countries like me too movements and so on and the reality uh youth generation try to react to the elections last time in parliament election in 2020 they just try to trust one more time to the democratic party and at this time, uh, Democratic Party permit first time in the history of Korea for participating into the elections, youth who just reach 80 years old. And this young generation actually voted for Democrats and remarkable one of Democratic Party was one of the reason of this one, what that this youth uh, votes. But if we compare, like, even though Democrats have many seats in parliament if you compare them uh, with conservative in every uh, region so one by one the differences between candidates in percentage was very very small like if examples 51 to 49 percent almost in every region so that was already signal that democrats lost their uh, trust in korea in general uh, one more point that my expectation high probably democratic party will be divided in the next five years and some you think of this party will develop something postmodern party which will be like joining more youth and will be answered on the questions and propose some items which uh young uh, generation in korea is expecting even now there is a, some co-chair of democratic party 26 years old girl 
uh, Pak Chokhong, uh, and they started very interesting movement like green uh, belt, green belt in Korean, which proposing some uh, young candidates for municipality elections in the suburb area representing the Democratic Party. So now they are starting with coordination, but later it can be. Another future that even though uh, your generation not satisfied about candidates, uh, the Korean young society, very apolitical. They are not very into the politics and maybe this situation also can be changed. In general, if we talk about uh, elections, no one satisfied about uh, candidates that there was like, even though they have like, till the last moment, no one clearly knows who will win. Uh, it was like competition between least possible bad candidates. And everybody say that that not really a president we're looking for, but there are no other options. So both uh, parties could not really uh, propose to the society really good uh, candidate, which will be very welcome. So people just voted because they vote for their mm -hmm. colors. And secondly, uh, it's because that no other choice. But in generally, in Korea, again, it is a specific of Korea, you don't need to have collect more than 50% of the total votes. And that means uh, with the less than 50% 50 vo 50 vo of the votes of the total society, you can become a president. That means last president or current president, he even don't represent the half of the current Korean society, which is also can be complicated because his uh, popularity already started to decrease just because simply you want to change his residency from Blue House to the new residency team, former uh, military, of, um, uh, military, it is military museum. He wants to uh, shift and starting like new beginning to show that we have no connection with the previous uh, um, uh, governance and previous mm -hmm. president's uh, experience, negative experience. But even in this case, uh, many people against of this for different point of view, that is not the point where you should start. Regarding to foreign policy, in general, uh, I don't think that so sharply differences will be happening because the agenda of foreign policy in Korea mostly uh, joy economic. It is like how to make new markets, how to expand uh, possibility of export. And so political uh, agenda is mainly of North Korea, how the relations will be be with Korea and geopolitical agenda is always designed in according to perception and the view of the United States towards the world. Even North Korean rapprochement during the Moon Chain was thanks to the different perception of President Donald Trump, which started some unique trend in uh, rapprochement with North Korea, which is also make push uh, some relationship between the two countries. And even Moon Chain till the last moment even believed that he will be able to sign peace agreement uh, together uh, to the North Korea before he will uh, end the term. But current new president, they all, he is expecting to have more strict policy towards North Korea, all of the, his messaging it. And even he did not start the, his term, all of the uh, misunderstanding happened between the two countries, North and South Korea, like Minister of Defense of Korea, uh, all of the mentioned that Korea has any possible uh, opportunities and infrastructure to hit North Korea and the sister of current leader of North Korea also reacted that we are ready to respond, should not uh, react like this. So all the detention started between the countries. If we look to other like Russian policy, uh, in general, for Korea, Russia is an expert market. And I should tell that till the last moment, Korea tried to uh, stay apart from the applications towards this country, but uh, even the United States has some uh, exceptions for what type items can export Korea, but nevertheless, Korea joined to the group of countries of sanctions and uh, now is a, one of the countries which non friendly country for Russia. This is like special function. Mostly Korea by uh, LNG, liquid natural gas from Russia. It is around 3 billion cubic meters per year, it is not big volume compared with the total impact of LNG, like consists around 50, 52 billion cubic meters annually. 
And that means uh, Korea can easily substitute these volumes by importing gas from another tax. But in general, if we talk about the currently uh, crisis, so uh, oil and gas prices increase and first time in the history, like because since 2021, European Union started to use new policy towards uh, gas prices, it is spot prices, which has never happened before. It, before it was long-term uh, agreement prices related to the oil. Now it is like uh, some hub prices which define it by demand and supply. The, since last year, oil gas prices rocketed 10 times and it's not only because of Russian crisis, it's also because of European Union policy. So these gas prices increase also will be like threatened by the current uh, conflict because Russia is one of the gas expert, uh, exporter. And in this regard, we can witness it that it also will add, uh, impact on Korea. Even from April, gas prices for customers started to increase and will increase three more times. Korea also making some messages. Yeah, if my time over. Yes. Um, okay. fine. What we'll do, I won't throw you another question because you've given us a lot to think about. If you wouldn't mind, I will move on to our next speaker. And then obviously in the question and answer session, we can pick up on uh, the issues you highlighted. So now we, as I said, are very, very honored to have Mr. Yoji Koda, Vice Admiral Retired, Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force. Mr. Yoji Koda is Vice Admiral of the, as I said, of Maritime, Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force, specializing in surface warfare. He's a graduate of the National Defense Academy. And in 1991, 1992, he was a student of the Naval Command College at the US Naval War College. After 40 years service, in NDA and JMSDF, he served as commander in chief of the self-defense fleet from 2007 until his retirement in 2008. In 2009 to 11, Mr. Koda became a senior fellow at Harvard University's Asia Center, where he worked on China's naval strategy. He served as an advisor to the National Security Secretariat until March this year. He is an erudite strategic thinker and an engaging speaker on naval power and contemporary security subjects. He's also a professional writer on maritime affairs and he's written several articles and recent ones include Japanese perspective on China's rise as a naval power and maritime strategy and national security in Japan and Britain. So welcome the Vice Admiral Koda and obviously for you and for us all, uh, it'd be very, very interesting to know what you think particularly the security impact would be. And obviously, with North Korea continuing to test missiles, and although it's being downplayed, whether you think that Japan is specifically concerned about this and general security. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I still have 10 minutes, right? Correct? Yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Now, you know, the say, Geographic point of view, Korea and Japan has been a very close proximity countries for the birth of the earth. But especially our security relationship after the World War II is not so close. Maybe many people got surprised, especially until 19. 90s, the I would say end of Cold War, the military to military relationship between two militaries had been very, very narrow. Only channel, open channel between two nations are the intel and information exchanges concerning the North Korean willful maneuvers. Other than that, we did not communicate each other. So no strategic exchanges or no military mutual visit. But after the end of the Cold War or demise of the Soviet Union, say the world started changing and the leadership of Japan and I think the South Korea started thinking 
we need to expand our military exchanges to meet the new challenges after the new world, that means the post-Cold War period. Then gradually we started. So practically speaking, the, the security relationship between our two militaries started sometime around year 1990. So only 30 years or a little more than 30 years history. That's our real nature. And then another fact is South Korea and Japan have been an allied nation with the United States on two different alliances. And many people may think alliance is the same, but the nature of the alliances are totally different. US rock alliance, uh, this is a Japanese perspective, okay? Korean people may not think so, but this is how we, we interpret. But US rock alliances or ally alliance is a kind of the custom made tailored alliance against the North Korean threat. And US Japan alliance used to be so, just focusing on the defense of Japan in Cold War days, preparing for the Soviet aggressions. At some point in 1990s, Japan, the US revised, reviewed, and redefined the alliances and expanded the area of responsibility from simply the defending Japan to more positive role in the stability of the region. So in this context, the US-Japan alliance is more value-added alliance, especially to the US forces operating in this area or even in the Middle East. So we think, J Japan think our alliances is a kind of the military enabler of the US forces stationed in Japan and operating around in this area and operating our neighboring areas to the Indian Oceans and Middle East. So there are differences between the alliances. And also the, you know, the geography may be a little different. Uh, there's one thing in common. Actually, we are a neighbor, neighboring countries with the nuclear powers, big powers, China, Russia, and perhaps North Korea. And not, South Korea and Japan, this is the same. But at the same time, Korea does not have a direct access to the open oceans. Korea has to pass through the choke points surrounded by Japanese island chain. And Japan has a direct access. And this also helped Japan to become a enabler of the US military because Japan always cooperate with the, the US Naval and the Air Forces. And from military point of view or US military forces point of view, you know, there, there are one thing in common and one thing in difference. And in this today's world, after the Cold War, South Korea and Japan are the only two nations that really maintains the physical US armed forces. And Europe, for example, NATO, you know, the after the end of the Saddam Hussein's invasion in Kuwait, Kuwait war, US had withdrawn all the army divisions in Europe to the US mainland. So South Korea is the only one nation in the world that still maintains the US army division in its soil. And Japan is the only nation in the world that maintains US carrier battle groups and amphibious battle groups and US Marines in its soil. So there are striking differences between two countries and NATO. So these are the kind of the common background that I want to understand. Then what would be the change? What Japan expect on the new Jung administration from May. Yeah, we accept there would be some changes 
a new president, the Mr. Yoon Sak Yul's policy, security policy. But the serious question is, would, there, would that be a big enough to really change our, you know, the kind of the cool relationship between Japan and South Korea? And yes, we need to do many things, but at the same time, who are the real God, guardians of the stability in this region? That's the United States. And US has a responsibility to come this area and to maneuver in case of contingency in South Korea or Korean Peninsula or contingency in Japan or South China Sea or even the Middle East. And in any cases, what is important for two nations to do is we, we means Japan and South Korea have to make shoulder to shoulder military support to operating US forces in this region. Not simply for the defense of each nation, but also for this Indo-Pacific area. And if Japan and South Korea hates each other for the in the future and not shoulder to shoulder relationship back to back relationship who would suffer the most the us forces and would us forces will be able to maintain an advantage that us had in, had have been enjoying since the end of the world war day in the world war 2 that is a network of the alliances but if Japan and South Korea does not come together and help or support the US forces, the result would be devastating. So leadership and the people in both countries have to understand this part. And there are many disagreements in social sectors but in security sectors, the story would be much simpler than the social areas. So that is the area we need to discuss more. And if possible, it's better to separate. And Japan, Russia and J Japan, China, to some extent, would be successful in separating. But in Japan, South Korea, we are not so successful. So that's a kind of the homework for the future. And I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. You've uh, given us a, a lot to think about. Um, from what you say, um, America's role is continuing to be crucial. But in the aftermath of what we've seen in Ukraine uh, and America's response, if there is any serious security threat in Japan or the region, do you think with the new, with the current president, Biden, uh, that he will intervene in any forceful he and his government? What's your thought? You know, that's a, a, a question, key question that would cause, uh, you know, the lot of the, the arguments or debate. And one clear thing is that the Ukraine is a non, non-NATO country. So US or NATO nations do not have any the legal responsibility to make a military intervention. You know, of course, I would ask the does the Biden administration's policy of dec declaring no military intervention at the very early stage of this you know, the situation, would it be wise or not? I'd say it's not wise, but still there is a striking differences between the, you know, the, the treaty responsibility. Say, and also another thing is that that's exactly what I said, you know, South Korea and Japan as a allied partner nations of the United States, we have to do a lot to enable the, the, the US forces in this region and also to invite the US forces 
to make the appropriate responsibility in any contingencies. And US, of course, is has a responsibility defined in our, our alliances. So US would come. But without our mutual effort and then understanding, you know, sometimes there would be some disagreement. So the best thing we should do and we can do in the future is not to make any disagreements. And if we trust each other, and that's the, the real nature for the last 70 years or so, I think we would be okay. But you know, we have to be separate. Is it the right policy or not? Or the obligation defined in the treaty? You know, th those are two totally different things. So uh, I'll stop here, but thank you very much for your question. Um, one of the questions that has, been, has come up um, from viewers, uh, one is that, and it seems something that you should answer, best place to answer is, what is one thing that Japan could do to improve its relations with South Korea? And then what could South Korea do to improve its relations with Japan? Any thoughts? Oh, yeah, you know, they say, I'm a strong advocate. I have been a strong advocate to improve the, the better relationship between South Korea and Japan. And say, of course, we have to separate our the nationalism or community opinion and the leadership maneuvers. So it may take longer time, but first thing for it, two nations to do is to make a summit meeting between the two, the, the Japan and South Korea. Maybe the first meeting, no result. Next three continuous meeting, maybe no progress. But you know, say so it takes only one hour and 30 minutes flight. When don't we meet frequently? Think about Europe in the Ukraine crisis. How many times the European leaders met in last six weeks period, almost every day they meet, then they exchange. And they are trying to make impossible possible. You know, so if there is one thing, my response is just the, make the summit meeting as frequent as possible, yeah. Well, thank you very much indeed. Now, here's a question that's slightly different. Has the popular television drama Crash Landing on You increase the desire of young South Koreans for unification with the North. And there's a note saying it has a different title in Korean. So I think that probably the two people best placed to answer this would be Michael Breen and Mr. Young Jino. So Michael, do you want to start off first? Um, yeah, I'll be very brief and defer to Mr. O because I've never heard of this. <laughs> I don't watch television much. <laughs> so I've never heard of it. I'm sorry, I can't help. So, Mr. Young, do you know, have you heard of it? Watched it in snatches, and it's a, you know, the, the uh, kind of a long series. It, it's quite, it was a quite popular. And, but I think, it's a, first of all, you know, the, it's, a, you know, the little bit different kind of treatment of the, the North Korea and the, you know, the South Korean relationship. It's, you know, the basically, I don't need to, you know, to go into the details of the, you know, uh, the, the plot of the story, but I think I'd say, you know, the certainly aroused the interest of young people about the North Korea. And as far as I'm concerned, you know, the, a lot of, you know, the uh, young, you know, the South Koreans, they don't, you know, pay much attention to uh, North Korean issues. Uh, even, you know, the, when the, you know, the, uh, the, you know, the ICBMs were, are, you know, the test of fire. And I, I don't think, you know, the, the, you know, the, you know, the, the Koreans in general are so accustomed to, you know, the seeing them, you know, the going, uh, uh, the missiles, you know, the, the flying many times there, but, you know, the show much interest in them. And I think, you know, the particularly, the, you know, young people have been, you know, the, the kind of, you know, the, uh, the uh, insulated from the, you know, the, the seeing the, you know, the North Korea as a real threat. But going back to the, you know, the, your question about the drama, I, I think it's a, 
you know, the one thing for sure is that definitely, it, you know, the arouse to, you know, the uh, uh, young Koreans to, uh, uh, to have, um, you know, the, the closer look at the, you know, the, uh, the, uh, our uh, neighbor, the, our closest neighbor. That's not true. And can I, can I go back to the, you know, can I, can you spare one minute? Of course, of course. I want to, you know, the, to, to, uh, to show my, you know, the agreement, with the, you know, what the Admiral, you know, the Koda said about the, you know, the necessity of the, you know, in the, you know, the Korea, South Korea and the, you know, the, uh, the uh, Japan, closer together. I think that, you know, no question about it. But as, you know, the, the, uh, the Rita says, if there's a, you know, the one thing that is, you know, the, uh, standing in the way of the, you know, the, you know, the closer relationship, I think it's not the, just the history, but it's it's like a, you know the politicians. They are, have been taking advantage of the you know the uh, the you know the people's the uh, the history as kind of you know the half artists when they are you know the, you know, the painted into the corner. They use this you know the, this issue to to divert the attention from the problems that they cause. It happened during the you know the uh, Imong Park's administrations you know the uh, days. When he, you know, the visited, you know, the uh, hotel, we didn't have to show that, you know, show we didn't have a, you know, the present, you know, the Kim Young Bak on that, you know, the disputed island to show that, you know, the hours, you know, the sovereignty over, you know, that, you know, the, the islands. I think, you know, the if they, you know, the uh, politicians are uh, are more, you know, the uh, cautious and more, you know, circumspect and take into the, you know. The real interest of the you know the, the countries, I think you know that we can have a you know the better future for the you know the two countries. I think that's you know very important. And and Ms. you know the Edmar Koda, thank you for your you know the great observation. Thank you. Oh, thank you. That's very good. So the next question now is slightly related. What are the feelings of the Korean diaspora towards re re reunification? Would a reunified Korea which would be much different from either the current North or South, attract many overseas Koreans to return to their homeland. Who feels in a position to, Michael, is that something that you might comment on? Um, yeah, I'll have a go at it. Um, first of all, I don't think a unified Korea is going to be a third entity. I mean, it, it might in a legal sense, they might call it the, um, Republic of Chosen or something like that. But uh, in reality, I think it's almost inevitably going to be a larger version of South Korea. And already overseas Koreans are returning to South Korea. Um, but I mean, one interesting thing about expats, and, and I'm one myself, I've been an expat for 40 years, is that, uh, and you know, I'm one of four brothers, uh, and my older brother lives in Ghana, and my other two younger brothers live in Australia. So we're all expats. And the thing about expats is that you retain a view of your country as it was when you left it. So I have a kind of 1970s view of Britain, if you like. And I think a lot of overseas Koreans have a, a, a very old, not, not all of them, because some of them return a lot, but, the, but they, they might sort of think of this issue in, in, in old terms. Uh, but having said that, uh, I think, you know, people, people need to work, okay? So they tend to come back when there's something to do their jobs, you know? Um, so in recent decades, last two or three decades, a lot of overseas Koreans have returned to South Korea. And if there was a unified situation and it were to happen quickly, the level of development, North Korea, the North Korean region would probably become the most rapidly developed economy in human history. And there would be all sorts of opportunities for people. And it I think it would electrify uh, the Korean diaspora. And I'm sure a lot of them would come back. Oh, yes, <laughs> it's I, I understand what you're saying, because I did a program on, you know, people who go overseas and what they think about their homeland. And as you say, I did some Poland, India and so on. And it is very true. They have this dream picture of the homeland, which no longer exists. 
So they're sort of fighting the stream. No, that's right. Um, another question, in what ways could women in Korea and Japan contribute in a yet unprecedented way to unification and reconciliation between the nations? And this has become even more relevant, given that under the president-elect, I could be wrong, but I get the impression that women aren't likely to have uh, you know, gender equality center stage. Um, again, maybe Michael and then the other panel. Mr. Young, you know, and Mr. Ibrahimov. So, Michael. Okay, I'll try two two parts to that. Um, one about the gender ministry issue, and then the other, what women can do to bring. Is it to bring the two Koreas together, or to bring Korea and Japan together? No, Koreas together. Two Koreas. Okay. Uh, the gender ministry thing um, during the election campaign. Uh, Mr. Yoon said he was going to close down the Ministry of Gender Equality. I believe South Korea is the only advanced democracy that has one. I might be wrong, but that has one of those sort of ministries. Um, and again, I think this is sort of one of these, these gestures. I mean, basically, uh, there's a bit of a backlash from young men against uh, feminism or some feminists. Uh, and I think he was pandering to that part of the electorate. This is the first time that gender became a significant reason for why people voted the way they did. And it was an issue that blew up. And I think what it is, is everyone in this country is on board with first wave feminism, you know, equal opportunity for men and women. In fact, in a lot of professions, uh, journalism, like Mr. O was saying journalism, for example, are probably more women going in than men. Now, it used to be a man's game um, and so on and so forth. Uh, women in university and so on. If you look at actually the outcome, like how many women there are in certain jobs and so on, you might get a different picture, but then there are other reasons for that, like having children and leaving jobs to get married and all sorts of things. Uh, but everyone's on board with that. What they're not on board with is the, I don't know if it's the second, third or fourth wave feminism, but it's that kind of man-hating feminism. And I think that's what the reaction is. There was a, a feminist group very famously had a, a very uh, they the very insulting towards korean men and they had a gesture and you know, i won't i won't explain it because it's too vulgar but you might be able to see what it means is this and a lot of people took offense at that and so in a way this is a bit of a reaction so the gender ministry does a lot of good stuff it helps uh, more than just helping women it does other things and i'm sure if the ministry is closed those functions would go to another part of government so i'm not sure how serious it is second uh, what women can do for unification i don't know i'm very skeptical of the in fact i dismiss as rather flaky these sort of um you know, marching across the DMZ and uh, all these kind of things. Uh, I, I think we've got a basic situation where we are demanding that North Korea um, hand over its nuclear weapons and they're not going to do that and we're stuck. So I, frankly, I'm not sure what women can do that nobody else can do. Okay, that makes sense. Would any of the other panelists like to say something or should we move on to other questions? Maybe I will add some couple of words. Uh, like feminism, as I already mentioned, is not really what we traditionally understand in Korea society. It is more reflection is to the uh, social reality, to the uh, like several components which has existed traditional or modern society and there's a some movement which is you cannot witness in other countries like sampo sampo is like to give up three points sampo gihagi it is like no boyfriend no relation no children or family and even sometimes expanding to the eight this is like reaction of dominant role of man it is social political and in uh, economy and in this regards women uh, reacted differently it is not really like uh postmodernist for uh international point of view but reactionist and have open branch and development so firstly uh, politically feminism in korea not so strong 
like even though women have social resistance and there was a such kind of me too movement several years ago in spite of this politically feminist party not supported by women in general and i don't think that in the middle and long term it will be happen in korea as for Can unification you know, yes yeah one one you know the party feminine issue that's you know the very interesting issue but i think it's not you know the it's uh not only you know the a movement in society but this time the the reason why this issue loomed large during the you know the election is a uh, you know like a the uh dog whistling the tactic employed by the you know the the one of the uh, you know the leading uh the persons in the you know the opposition parties that's the Yijun so 36 year old party chairman he's a uh, you know the harvard educated i think he's a uh, you know the he said, you know, deliberately used this gender issue to try and lure the voters both of the, you know, the young people. But you know, when you look at the, you know, the result of the, you know, the election, then I think it's a kind of he's a, you know, the tactic backfired because you know the like a seventy percent of the woman, a uh, young woman, voted for the, you know, the the uh, the uh, Jae-myung, the you know, the lost the candidate. And 70% of the you know the, the you know the young you know male, they you know the voted for the you know the uh, the uh, the Yoon Sung Yeol, the winner in the, this election. So when you look at the, you know the both sides, it's not the you know the, the winning strategy. But the problem is the guy the you know the Lee Jun Suk you know the try to you know try to advantage of this you know, the put the you know this gender issue to use it to for the advantage of uh, like in, in the election. But, that's that's kind of you know the uh, not just the backfire the, the, in the in the voting, but I think it created you know the additional divisions in our society. That could be you know the uh, that could be that should have been you know the addressed different manner for the you know the you know the whole good of society. Thank you so much. Um, so since we're coming to the end, I really have just room for one more question. Um, and I thought a broader one might be that you know we've heard from almost every panelist that the younger generation don't seem to be um, too involved or concerned about politics. And is that so, is this a worry? I mean, I think, you know, Professor Ibrahimov, you said that, you know, there are a few young candidates. So what does that say about just the future of South Korea, leave alone security issues on every level? Um, so who should we start with first? And should we go with Mr. Ibrahimov and then Mr. Yong Janin and Michael Breen? And Okay. okay. Sorry. Let me let me try first because I okay. have a, you know the, the two sons that they are you know in their you know early thirties, and I think you know the, it's true they it's it's you know the this you know the valuable lesson from this you know the election is that I think young people get kind of galvanized into you know the, uh, the you know the, uh, the you know the to into thinking that the politics are important and politics. Are important because they, you know, the it can affect their future. In other words, they, you know, the when I look back and you know they started to, you know, to to show lack of attention on this, you know, the, the, uh, the election itself. But as it progresses, as you know, the the you know the election day uh, came near, they kind of you know get themselves educated because of, you know the uh, for example the you know the. The issue that you know the alienated the you know the young people from the you know the main main you know the ruling party candidate Mr. Lee was the failure by this you know the incumbent government, the you know the progressive government about the real estate policy. Because of the you know the the failures by the you know this administration, the you know the housing crisis went beyond the means of the young people, very beyond not possible. So they got angry. And in the process of you know the the uh, the uh, big getting angry, they are you know the the you know the uh, realize came to realize politics is important. Politics would affect their livelihood. That's my thinking. Um, since we're really out of time, um, do you think it's a tricky one? Just one quick sentence each of you about what we should go away thinking about the future for the region. Um, so, Michael, one quick. Um, I would brace 
I think we have to brace ourselves for some uh, sort of noisy exchanges between the two Koreas, possibly a, a provocation by North Korea. I think this year is going to be a little bit like it was Mr. O was describing before the Pyeongchang Olympics in 2018. Um, and But I don't think we should mistake gestures and shouting for real conflict. Uh, but I think things are going to get a little bit heated this year. Thank you, Mr. Yoji Koda. Any brief thoughts on? Yeah, just quick thoughts on the younger generations, you know, the Japan and I think South, South Korea too, you know, especially after the Korean War, you know, there are no real wars. You know, of course, in South Korea, some many the, the conflicts or uh, frictions generated by North, but basically no real life threatening or life or death issues. But in recent years, the rise of China, Taiwan, and including Ukraine, you know, the those are the, the real wake up call for younger generations. They looked looked like indifferent, but today they started thinking about that. Right. So that's I think you know a, a little sad thing, you know, especially due to the sad phenomena or incidents. But good thing for you know providing more motivation for the younger generations. So I think we would, we we would get a better societies in the future. Thank you. Sorry, I wanted very brief because we're over time. Yeah, yeah actually, you new, gen new generation not really looking for unification with North Korea. If it will be happen one day, it will be like European Union process, like within the long term, with the change of generations, and after this. Now it is not idea not so popular. As I said that three different generations and three different polar opinions. So new generation not really have agenda of unification of Korea. Thank you. Majority. Valuable, valuable insights. As, you know, we've covered so much and we could go on, as you can see from the questions. But the moment I can just thank you so much to all the participants and for the organizers and, and also Peter Zora of EMAP. Thank you all and uh, hope to see you again sometime and wish you a peaceful future. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very you. much. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Hey. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.